isn't this time of year great? The greenhouse is just bursting with life and I'm getting ready now to um, prick out some of the seedlings that are at a size that's good enough for me to put them on into pots or their own little kind of seedling plug trays. Now I'm just breaking up the soil um, because the delicate roots of young plants don't like to have great big clumps of soil to try and push through. So I find this actually quite a satisfying job. Just getting really nice, fine soil ready for potting on. Actually, let me show you what I've been growing and what I'm gonna put on. And some of it's for my own garden, some of it's for the Grow Paradise Nursery. And um, I might be kind and share some with friends and family. We'll see. So those of you who subscribe to the channel will know roughly what my setup is in the garden. But if you're new here, I'm gonna tell you this greenhouse is six foot by eight foot. That's not huge. That's a standard domestic greenhouse. And in this space, I grow all of the homegrown plants for the Grow Paradise Nursery, all the plants for my own garden and everything that I share with friends and family. But the seeds, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, all come out of this cheap, unheated propagator. Now, I got this from Amazon and to heat it, I just have a cheap heat mat underneath. And the heat mat is sat on this manky bit of cardboard because the metal shelves in a greenhouse tend to get quite cold. So the cardboard is just gonna protect the heat mat from having to work too hard and cost me a fortune in running costs. Now that is the size of the propagator and thousands of plants come out of that each year. Now my tip is to use smaller seed sowing devices. So this is a quarter seed tray. If you imagine a full seed tray is that size, it's gonna be way too big for most domestic horticulture. So you can grow more species in a small space using one of these, or use one of these square pots. That's roughly half the size of the seed tray. And you can squeeze the tight edges of the square pots together and grow even more species of weird and wonderful plants in a tight space. Now this one is hibiscus cochineus, which is a hibiscus that Mike Clifford introduced me to when I saw it growing in his garden. It's got beautiful red flowers and it's really, really exotic looking. And I'm pleased to say it's been easy to grow from seed. And I've got seed available on the Grow Paradise shop at the moment. But this is about the size now that it's ready for pricking out because you can see it's got good established seed leaves but there are also true leaves emerging here. Now seed leaves are just the leaves that are inside of the seed capsule and emerge and those first leaves provide the early food for the plant to become established. The true leaves are a good sign that it's time to prick the plant out, give it its own space to become established before this becomes overcrowded. But that's a new plant for the Grow Paradise shop this year. I'll show you a couple more, but not everything that I'm growing at the moment because it will be giving away too many secrets. But I will tell you a few. It's another new one to the Grow Paradise shop. Can you guess what it is? Again, really, really good germination rate. This is in the tomato family. Actually, same as the tomato family, the nightshade family. And I say nightshade with this one because the fruits are really poisonous. So don't mistake them for tomatoes. Confusingly, its common name is the kangaroo apple. It's Selenum lacinatum. And I love this plant because it grows as a small tree or shrub, but the foliage is never identical. They've got irregular shapes and I can never find one leaf that looks the same as another, which is just a small feature of this really nice shrub that I like to grow. I'd call this um, half hardy. It survived winters before. I don't think it would have survived this past winter with the temperature drops that we've had, but I've got plenty there for me to grow and to stick on the online shop in the coming weeks and months. Let's go for one more. Mm, I'm choosing here. Like I said, I've got lots of seeds coming up. I'm gonna struggle for space when it comes to potting them all on. Can you guess what this one is? It's a bromeliad. It's a terrestrial bromeliad. It's Puya alpestris. It's that sapphire blue Puya. When I show friends and family photographs of this in flower, yeah, 
I'm sad. I do that. Everyone else is sharing holiday pictures or pictures of their children, not me. If I see an interesting flower, I'm that guy. And I'm sure I'm not alone, so please comment and tell me if you do that too. But it's a, one of the bluest flowers I've ever seen. Now, I've got some here that I sowed last year, and this is that plant that's called the sheep eater, or rumor has it, it's called the sheep eater, because of these reverse barbs on the leaves. And it's said that when sheep approach the plant in its natural habitat, the reverse barbs hook on to the wool of the sheep and the more they struggle, they can't get out, they'll decay at the base of the plant and in turn provide it with food and nutrients. Now whether that's just a myth, I don't know, but I enjoy the story and I enjoy sharing it. Feel free to do the same. I've also grown these abutilons, which featured on a YouTube short recently. And you can see how much they've come on if you saw that short. I'm excited by these because I had six or seven different coloured cultivars of abutilons growing in my garden. They were outside and the bees were visiting each plant and cross-pollinating them. And come autumn last year, they were covered in seed pods, which means they've hybridized potentially. And the seeds were viable and they've come up really, really well. So there's potential for this plant to be a new exciting hybrid. There's also potential for it to be a muddy brown boring hybrid. Only time will tell, so I've got to nurse this on and see if I can get some really cool coloured or shaped or unusual sized flowers out of these new hybrids. So yeah, stay along for that journey and we'll find out in due course. The abutilons, on a side note, have actually stayed outside in my garden all winter. They're in pots. I push them up against the south facing brick wall of the house because it's just a slightly warmer microclimate there and they've all survived. Yeah, the tips of some of the stems are a bit frosted off, but they shrugged off that minus five degrees Celsius, which is impressive, especially considering that they're growing in pots. And as I've said, plants that grow in pots aren't gonna be as frost tolerant as those in the ground. So I bunched them together, put them against a self-facing brick wall. I followed all of my own tips and it seems to have worked. So I'm gonna have loads of flowers in the garden again next year. All the ones that I know are colorful, and these potentially exciting or potentially boring <laughs> abutilon hybrids. Now, it's not just seeds um, that I grow to propagate plants. I love taking cuttings. In fact, most of my aeoniums, like this Schwarzkopf, and this really nice Aeonium Cyclops, was a tiny, tiny cutting. And I'm glad, actually, that I took cuttings because I think I've lost the cyclops that I left outside experimenting with winter temperatures. It's always worth taking cuttings as backups if you're experimenting with plants, but even if you're not, because you don't know if there's gonna be a drought or cold wind, a virus or a pest infestation, the more backups you can have if you've got space available, the safer your collection's gonna be. Actually, one way that I do it is I'll take cuttings of plants. Um, as you know, I'm in a small garden, I've got a small greenhouse. And if it's plants that I wanna keep safe and to be able to take cuttings from in the future, I will disguise sharing them with other people as kindness, <laughs> but it's not. I know that those people have that plant in their garden. So if I lose mine, I can sneak into theirs and take cuttings. That's a good tip. If you've got friends that love plants and have some more space than you, give them cuttings of your plants and then you can take cuttings of that one if you lose yours later down the line. Kindness is the trick. Call it kindness. <laughs> I've given away like the darkest sides of my soul. Now, I've also taken cuttings of Arundo Donax, which you saw me doing a few videos back. And I'm pleased to say that the stems are shooting. Now there's no signs of roots yet, but in my experience, you get the shoot first and then from this fresh growth, you'll get one or two roots start to emerge. I can then cut this back to here and pot it on. So I'm just gonna be patient, keep changing the water, as I said in the video, and uh, see what happens. And I know that a lot of you followed along, so let me know how yours are getting on. Now, in addition to that, I've propagated my sugar cane. You might remember that I left one sugar cane plant outside, and I'll admit, it's not looking great. I cut it down a little bit. Um, there wasn't much life in the stems, but I'm gonna leave it out there. I'm gonna practice what I preach. 
I'm gonna wait till spring, maybe early summer and see if it regrows. If not, I will dig it up and I'll have an opportunity to plant something different out in the garden in that spot. But I do know it has a degree of cold tolerance because I kept three potted plants in my parents' greenhouse, which drops down to about four or five degrees Celsius, and it survived. How do I know it survived? I took cuttings off of the stems hmm, five or six days ago, and in that time, they have already produced roots and shoots, which is like gardening gold. Now you'll notice that they're shooting horizontally because I have propagated these by laying them flat in a tray of water just to try a new technique. And I think as a tip, it's worked better because I've left two nodes per each section of stem. And by doing that, there's more sort of plant mass and energy in this material that I'm using for a cutting. So there's more for it to put into producing new cells and new growth. Now it's getting its green foliage out, which is full of chlorophyll. That's gonna be what produces its own energy for this to become established as a standalone plant. And I think this second node, now that it's photosynthesizing and producing energy, we've got one root here, but there's signs of green shoots coming. So I should be able to get two plants by chopping it there and potting them each on. So that's actually a really good way of propagating sugarcane. And I love any propagation where you can see the progress happening. Because as I've said before, I am an impatient gardener. So visual feedback that my efforts are paying off is fantastic. Perhaps that's why I like tropical plants because they grow so fast. All in all, I'm pleased with how propagation has sort of ticked over this winter in the greenhouse, bearing in mind how expensive electricity is and the fact that I haven't been heating this greenhouse to anywhere near the temperatures that I have in previous years. It drops down to five, sometimes even four degrees Celsius, but all of the cuttings are growing on and the seedlings on a small, affordable heat mat are growing away really well. And in the next three or four weeks, potentially, the ambient temperature in the greenhouse, because of the natural daylight, is gonna be plenty for me to prick these seedlings out and pot them on. And I will be doing that on video and I'll share it with all of you. Um, maybe you'll see some of the other species that I'm growing. Now let me know what species you're growing or if there's any exciting plants you're looking for seeds for and maybe I can help you out with the Grow Paradise shop. Thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying the content, please hit subscribe and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you.